Hello everyone and welcome to the 1000 subscriber Q&A answers period. I asked you for questions, you asked me questions, and now I'm going to answer those questions. Starting with a question from Reinhardt, who asks, What are your thoughts on terraforming? It's cool! I wish we had more of it, honestly. I... Yeah, I kind of wish that terraforming was one of those things that got used more often, because there's a lot of potential for what you can do with it, especially for making bridges, maps like Adansonia, for instance, where you have the little plateau. It seems really separated. But if you were to build a bridge between the two, like between your main, up in the main base section, and or main base is over here, and the other sections over here, if you were to build something between that, that I think would work really well. Because what would end up happening is you'd actually have a way of defending that plateau without having to worry so much about going a long way around. Or maps like, well, I mean, City can kind of mess around with, I guess. I mean, mostly it's just there's a lot of places where you could use it in various maps to bridge gaps and make things accessible, which you see it used occasionally, but I think it's a little bit too expensive for a lot of people to want to bother with it, especially since it's kind of niche. Walls, on the other hand, which is the next part of it, is that, like, saying that it seems like it's the coolest mechanic, but all it's ever used is walls for blocking fire and blocking vehicles. It's actually a bigger part of the walls. And for commander pits, so commanders can save themselves. And... Yeah, again, this is the thing, is that it's only really used for those things. It's only really used for commanders. Honestly, in practice, that's all you really ever see it for. Either burying commanders or burying heavy units. That's a good use. And walls, I see from time to time, but that's also a good use. But yeah, I would like to see more ramps. I'd like to see more messing with the pathing of the map. But I understand it's kind of expensive, and I think it's more so that it's kind of out of the way. If you think about it in terms of the, in terms of the controls, it's not too far out of the way. But it's still kind of unusual. It's not something you think about too much. And it's not a direct thing you win with. It's good for defense. It can help for some sneaky offensive strategies. But so can just walking your units in or having enough units or using gunship transports. So that's the thing. A lot of the time people just use other means that seem more useful or at least are units. The next question is from Ceres. Ceres. Several questions, actually. So, first off, favorite factory to play? Favorite factory to play would be the Spider Factory. Although, I tend to play Cloakies because Cloakies are a good factory in general. But yeah, Spiders are awesome. Spiders have been historically my favorite factory, I think since the beginning, since I ever started playing years ago. I thought Spiders were the coolest thing. How did I get into Zero-K? So, it's kind of funny. I got into Zero-K because... First off, I got an Acron. I got an Acron because of a TV Tropes article, which I know is the weirdest thing to get into a thing because of, but yes. Because of that, I got an Acron. Because of Acron, I met Google Frog, and because of Google Fro knowing who Google Frog was, and because I found out about the Planetary Annihilation Kickstarter, I went and just got Planetary Annihilation, because I was like, okay, this is really cool. It's a neat idea. I like the whole planet system. I thought it was a cool concept, though in practice it didn't work out, and... Quite frankly, I think that the game that Uber was planning on making, that they were working on that... I can't remember what it was even called. They, they started a Kickstarter for it. It was sort of this, like, Cthulhu versus Robust type thing. I think that would have worked better, because I think the planet system had issues. But that's beside the point. Point is, Google Frog pointed out how Zero-K was handling all this interface stuff and total annihilation style play better, and the physics style play better. And there was a lot of stuff I'd been looking for with similar games. Like, Supreme Commander, for instance, I got into because... I, which actually answers a later question, I got into because it had the physics thing. That seemed really cool. Ultimately, the game I really want to see as something that's this RTS-style thing is the Myth series, Bungie's old Myth series. That's what makes me like the physics-based play, because that game massively relies on it. It's a tactics game more than a strategy game, but the fact that it uses physics for the projectile dodging and such is something I think is amazing. It's something that I go back and forth on because it can lead to really weird, unpredictable situations, but I do think it's pretty cool. I like it. I like the fact Zero-K uses it, and it's one of those things that, among a lot of the other things Google Frog mentioned in the Planetary Annihilation forums, made me think, hey, maybe I should give the Zero-K thing a try. Like, for real. I, I think I messed around with it previously for some reason, but that was the reason I tried it and actually stuck with it. So for my favorite RTS game, next part of the question, I don't know... I mean, 
there are a lot of RTS games I've liked. And I'd say the one that I've played them. I mean, obviously, Zero K, I've cast a lot. That's the one I cast. That's the one I mainly play. That's the one I mainly focus on. Not sure I'd call it my favorite, which is kind of funny because I do cast it. I do really like it, but it's one of those games where there's a lot of concepts I like, but sometimes it frustrates me and I don't always play it as much. Yeah, the one... One game I kind of wish got more attention and more love would be Rise of Legends. Which I know is kind of silly, but it's the Rise of Nations sequel. Well, sequel slash spiritual successor. It's officially billed as a sequel, but it's obviously not because Rise of Nations was a civilization type thing. And so that spanned all of time, so you can't really go with the sequel unless it's Alpha Centauri, the RTS. Which would be cool. But no, Rise of Legends, I thought it had some really neat systems. The way that you captured cities and the way that you just generally got territory by multiple means. Like you didn't necessarily just have to capture them by fighting, you could also buy them. It got it got a broader approach to strategy than just the pure military strategy, but not in a way that, say, Age of Empires does it where it tends to bog down the game. Like it's one thing that I think, say, well, ensembles games in general have an interesting approach to, where it's not just military, but it also tends to be a really slow and sluggish approach to, because there's so many different resources and because there's so many different ways of blocking up people from coming in, and it, like, it's neat, but it's not necessarily fun. I thought Rise of Legends was a much better balance struck between that. But I wouldn't say it's my favorite. It's just one of those games that I think could have gotten more love. I certainly liked it, but yeah, that was kind of a, that was a bit of an issue. Anyway. Next one. Would you be casting, interested in casting other TA-based games like Balance Annihilation, Stream Commander, Forged Alliance Forever, or Planetary Annihilation? I have done a bit of Planetary Annihilation streaming, though like I said before, I... Okay, so here's the thing. Balance Annihilation and Supreme Command, actually all three of them for the same reason, probably not much. I don't find them as interesting because it is largely just macro build-up push. I mean, it's a little bit more than that, but my experience, especially with Supreme Commander, because of how difficult it is to move stuff around, there's there's a limitation to how many units can move at once. You basically can only have, I think, three units moving in any given cycle. So you say if you grab 100 units and tell them to move, they'll move like three or four at a time in small chunks every few hundred milliseconds. Stuff like that makes it really hard to control. It's one of the things I dislike about the game and one of the things that makes the whole idea of physics-based projectiles, this cool idea that drew me into the game in the first place, become far less relevant. So, yeah, probably not. Balance Annihilation has more going for it than Supreme Commander does as far as making sure that all the systems actually make sense together. But again, it's neat, but still kind of one of those games where it's all macro, and I find that tends to drag. Planetary Annihilation, that's just really hard to spectate. Like, just the fact that there's a planet, you have to go around either side of the planet. It's like, how do you how do you deal with that? It's just... No. You have one side of the planet, and you have the other side of the planet, and you don't necessarily have on the other side. I know there are things that basically unfold the entire planet, and that's nice, but it's not really enough. So, nah, probably not Planetary Annihilation. Maybe I'll look at Balance Annihilation, assuming it's not just 5v5 Delta Siege Dry, and Serene Commander... I've played it. I've seen casts for it. There was a there was a group that did casts for it for a few years. About 10 years ago. I can't remember what they're called. There was a Q in the name somewhere. Anyway, that that was kind of interesting. But I do feel like that game's a bit limited as far as spectatability goes. I think Zero K is much better in that regard. It's more transparent. It's more Well, okay, they're all really fairly transparent, but Zero K I find is more transparent. It's got a smaller scale, so it's easier to focus on what individual units do, which is a really cool thing to have. It's not just big masses of armies. You're thinking, oh, hey, this one glaive, this one glaive could go up, do something amazing and go around, be micro, like, mad, destroy all the metal extractors, destroy all the power plants, possibly kill a factory if played right. Like, little things like that in that Zero K allows, which the other games don't, don't encourage. They technically allow, but because of how quick units get built in Balance Annihilation, Supreme Commander, Planetary Annihilation, Supreme Commander especially, that kind of per unit micro is possible. It just doesn't come up because your opponent... Yeah, you've done all this work with one unit. Your opponent's built 50. Whereas in 0k, you've done all this work with one unit. You've still been building a few. Your opponent's built three or four. So it's much more effective to go around and do sneaky little tactics. It's a bit map dependent. And if anyone was watching the stream I did earlier today, which... Okay, so October 6th. That I did on October 6th. The video's then. There was a match in Adansonia that I casted where... 
it kind of was clear who was winning based on early economic leads. That's one of those things 0k occasionally does. That's one of those things I noticed that Supreme Commander seemed to have happen a lot. But more importantly, like I said, it just doesn't have that same spectatability, that same spectacle of one unit potentially doing some amazing thing. Or a few units doing some amazing thing. Just it the scale gets big enough that it starts to become difficult for for it to seem exciting in the same way that 0k does. Like 0k yeah, it kind of is like StarCraft in that respect. StarCraft's the same way, where a handful of units can do a lot of work and that makes it interesting. Zero K is exactly the same. A handful of units can do a lot of work and that makes it really interesting because you never quite know what any group of units is going to end up doing. So, like I said, I like that. Back. I like that aspect. But yeah, I might, I might look at Balance Annihilation. Besides, it's something besides five v five DSD. That's the one thing I'd really rather not just do a bunch of that. Because I have done a Nada tournament before, so I am open to it, but I'm not going to focus on it. Next question from Kingstad. Will you fight me? Yeah. I mean, I'm not always on, but if I'm on, you know, just ping me. So, yeah, totally. Okay, next question. Oops. From Deep Sheet Misfit. What do you do with your life other than 0k related stuff? I am a software developer. I work on software. I don't really gonna, I don't want to go into too much detail to avoid doxing myself, but yeah, I work on software. It's not games related. It's more of an industrial software thing because industrial software is where you go if you want to actually have a life, in my understanding. I haven't done games development, but games development is, of course, notorious for being extremely demanding on one's time and basically taking over one's life. Industry development is much better if you want to have a nine to five, eight hour, like if you want to have a nine to five, five day work week, get something in industry there. I mean, a lot of industrial jobs are really looking for people. So you can get in, get paid reasonably well, have a life outside of work. In my case, I'm actually kind of lucky too, because the stuff I work on has more to do with graphics, like 3D, 2D graphic stuff and other engine related, like other rendering engine stuff. It's stuff that's tangentially related to games. So my experience with games, that is relevant. And I get to feel like I'm doing some stuff without feeling like I have no life. Apart from that, I've also been taking acting lessons because I am trying to work. I mean, it's tough, but I am working on getting into voice acting or any kind of acting, really. I don't, it doesn't have to be voice. Originally, I was thinking voice. Over time, I've become much more amenable to the idea of doing something on screen. Stage might be fun, but that doesn't pay well. But yeah, it's, that's the other thing I've been working on is acting. So I've been doing stuff with that. I have demos. They're on a SoundCloud. I don't really put it out too much on the internet yet, but yeah, I do regular auditions on online, and that's a thing. It's it's a nascent thing. I've only started doing it about a year or two ago. It's not something I've put much effort into, but it is something I've been gradually working on. Okay, next question. Okay, for uh, three next three questions. Do you prefer the spring version over the Steam release of Zero K, and why? So I assume what you mean by that is, do I prefer the way that Zero K used to be set up? Because for those of you who are not familiar with 0k prior to the Steam release, or prior to Chobby even, the way it worked before is that you had the Spring Engine, and then you had Lobbies. And the Spring Engine was essentially just the game. So you'd get in, you'd load, there'd be a map, there'd be the players, all that stuff would be there, that's it. And you had the Lobby, and the Lobby would handle all the organization, all the networking, all the connections between players, all the cho choosing of what map to play, what players to play, what game to play, because most lobbies, with the exception of 0k lobby, which was specific to 0k, obviously, most lobbies, like Spring Web Lobby or Spring Lobby, or I think there was another one, but I'm slipping right now. Anyway, those lobbies would typically let you choose which game to play, as well as which map and who the players were and any bots and any of that stuff. And I hated the old lobby system. Like, I really like the way that 0k is built now. I understand why the lobby system was the way it was, and I understand the value of it, because the nice thing about the way the lobby system was is that if you had one game, in this case 0k, that's a big game, everyone plays it, or everyone in that community plays it, but you have another game like, well, say, Spring 1970, or 1944, the Tanks game, or you someone makes, say, Complete Annihilation Kingdoms, actually does make that, that was a thing that I think Carapero was working on for a while. Let's say that gets made, and that becomes a thing. 
Well, with the Spring Lobby system, it's easier to popularize that because you see games for 0k, like, see a bunch of games for 0k, a bunch of games for Balanced Annihilation, and then there'll be this one game, and you're like, oh, what's this? Oh, it's, it's Complete Annihilation Kingdoms. Oh, I wonder what that's like. And you go and check that out. I get the value of that, but to me, it was just too much of a logistical hurdle to put together what to do for most people. Like, get into a lobby, and then get the games, and then figure out that you're downloading the games, and... There was already three different types of lobbies as it was. You had 0k lobby, which was specific to 0k, but could theoretically play these other games. Spring lobby, which was really basic and was around for a long time and was honestly very difficult to use and had many options that, like things like choosing start location and such. Oh, right, that's the other thing. I'll get to that in a second. But yeah, things about choosing start location and other things that seemed like there's way too much for what a player should be able to do in a game for the game to have a solid sense of competition. And it was kind of a mess to get going. Now, the other thing is start locations. Something which isn't so much a lobby thing, but it was. So, again, for those of you not familiar with what the game was like before the Steam release and before Chobby, what would happen is that every lobby just had the map. That was it. You just had a map. You had nothing else. Stuff like where people should start was not part of it. Start boxes were usually defined on the fly. Now, in some cases, like 0k lobby, there were some scripting going on. If you actually look at the maps, you'll see the scripting some, on some older maps is still there, where it'll automatically send box commands to the spring lobby protocol, and that will handle setting up the boxes by default. That's no longer really the case because at some point about two years ago, there was a Lua box system that was created, at least for 0k, which is amazing. I'm so glad. I think it was Sprung that made that, and I'm so glad that was made. That to me is one of the biggest things that makes the Steam release of 0k work as well as it does. But in general, it's just a good thing to have. And that was one of the other things lobbies had a hard time with. Like I said, you kind of had to set up everything. I think if the Spring Lobby setup didn't have start boxes, the start boxes and stuff like that was part of the map. And if stuff was a little bit more divided by game, like maps by game or something like that, I get the idea of having maps that you can play with any game that's kind of nice, but in general, that doesn't work. Hide and Seek, for instance, that's a zero K map that a lot of people kind of dislike because it's not a zero K map. It's a, I think it's Tech Annihilation? No, XTA. It's an XTA map. XTA is a totally different mod that I've not really played much myself, but that's what the map was built for. It was not built for zero K. And that's one of the reasons why it's such a weird map in zero K because that's not what it was meant for. So that's the thing. I can understand why it's nice you have a mod and there are all these maps that exist. This giant map pool for all these different games that your own, well at the time it was mod, now it's game, your own game can use. Except that those maps are not built for that game. They're built for other games that just happen to work with yours because of the same engine. So it's an, it was a neat idea. I can understand why it was done. I can understand why it made sense, especially from sort of the open source style of development where you have a bunch of different objects that are all working together, protocols that keep them together. You're essentially piping from one thing to the next. I get that, but I totally think that for the purposes of a game, that's not the way to go. I think for the purposes of most software, that's a good way to go, just not games. The games tend to work better when they're self-contained. Everything is designed around them and designed around one game. And maybe stuff can be ported from one to the other, but it's... Yeah, it just didn't, didn't really work as well as one might like. So I prefer the Steam release mainly because it just creates a nice unified game out of 0k rather than making it part of this mess and you're not really sure where to go or what to do, which is what I always found with the old lobby system. Next one. Second, you seem to have a knack for the mathematical side of strategy gaming. Is this a result of your education or an interest in that kind of stuff? Hmm. It's probably both. I mean, I'm... It's partly my education, but I've also been... Not to my own horn, but I have also been fairly numerate. Like, as in growing up, I was pushed forward in maths because I did it better than my peers. I hate, I hate to bring that up, but yeah, maths has always been a strong point for me. So I think it's not so much either the education or the interest, but rather that my aptitude, I hate to think of the natural talents, totally different discussion, but my aptitude for maths meant that I tended 
to, towards math. Like I said, I do programming for a living. Like, computer science is my major. That That's what I got my bachelor's in. So I have... I definitely have the strength in maths. I don't think it's that strong. And I think it's much more in the sort of maths that you get tested on in elementary and high school. The, like, simple arithmetic, algebra stuff into polynomial root finding that you get. I think that's... High school, at least in North America, for those of you in Europe, I don't know what your education system is like, and I realize most of my audience is European, so I don't know what yours is like. For North America, for Canada in particular, and North America in general, maths up to the university level is primarily focused on building up to polynomial root finding. So you get an equation like x squared equals x plus 5 or something like that, and you got to work out, okay, what does x equal? And then occasionally you get cubics, but it's often quadratics. So you do get into a bit of trigonometry and a bit of geometry and light proofs and some systems of equations later on and it's, it's changed since my days like i graduated from high school 12 years ago so i'm not really sure what it's like now i haven't looked into the new curriculum and they changed the curriculum around the time that i was leaving so it might have changed i heard that it actually got a little bit better at teaching more broad logical elements of maths like the base elements stuff that i didn't learn until university about the more well like basic logic boolean logic and Stuff to do with proofs and stuff possibly to do with some more abstract things besides just arithmetic, algebra, and polynomial root finding. But those things were the things that were focused on elementary and high school. When I got into university, it was a little harder because, well, I hadn't done things like generating functions or hadn't really done a lot of linear algebra, though I love linear algebra. I just, it took me a little while to get used to it. And those were things I'd never touched. I didn't even know about. I just got into university and those are courses I had to take. And I had to work my butt off to figure them out. So yeah, education definitely later on became the main focus, but started out with more of an aptitude than an interest, and then education just came with that. So yeah. And then finally, what other RTS games do I really like? I went over that a little bit earlier, mentioning my lamentation for Rise of Legends. Another one I lament is Universe at War. I kind of wish that'd get more time in the oven. For those of you who've never heard of it, which is probably most of you, that was a game released in 2007 by the makers of Command & Conquer. And it was kind of a Command & Conquer-like game. It was also made by the people who made who went on to make Grey Goo. And Grey Goo takes a lot of ideas from it, but I feel like Universe at War did more with the idea of moving bases. However, as neat as it was, the game was both released about a year earlier than it should have been. Like, reading interviews, it looks like it got pushed forward by a year. And having played the game, there were a lot of balance problems and design problems that would have been fixed with another year in the oven. One of the sides apparently didn't even exist until about a few months before the release. And that side also had one major broken tactic involving basically having infinite resources. The Most of the game, like you had two sides that would take resources off the map, like Reclaim. Basically two sides that would essentially Reclaim, one of which that did this, did it in a gradual fashion. One of, one of them that occasionally could just Reclaim an entire set of resources all at once. Which is pretty cool. And then the last side just had static economy structures that just made money over time. They basically just had metal makers. That was their only economy. One of their units could reclaim effectively, but largely it was just a metal maker economy. And obviously, that meant that one of the sides had a much better time building up. And there was a lot of little design problems that the game had that largely came down to being rushed. And also, it required games for Windows Live. Hopefully no one remembers that little mistake of a service attempt. But yeah, that ended up being a massive albatross around the game's neck. But otherwise, games that actually are halfway successful, StarCraft 2 I do play from time to time. That's a pretty decent game. It has some linearities to it. It's designed in a way that tends to be very direct in how you should do it. That's one of the criticisms StarCraft has always had. But it's also kind of nice because it means that it makes it a little more direct to solve the problem. You realize, okay, this is what I need to do based on what my opponent's doing. And Granted, that's kind of true of all RTS games. I guess I just find that StarCraft tends to make it more obvious, which can be nice. It's debatable. But otherwise, yeah, that's... Those are the ones I really want to talk about. I guess another RTS game I, I really like, though I don't play much, again, is the Myth series. Myth 2 in particular. It's not played very much by a lot of people. It's there's a handful of dedicated people that still play, and, but nah, it's kind of dead. I mean, it's 20 years old. Not surprising. Holy shit, it's actually 20... Yeah, something like that. Sheesh, wow. Huh. Mind you, again, that is a real-time tactics game, not a real-time strategy game, so, man, yeah, whatever. 
Eh. Next question. How do you feel about putting away a whole one cent every time a player fails to reclaim? Why should I put away the one cent? I'm not the one failing to reclaim here. I mean, if anything, it should be just a general, like, like a swear jar. I didn't reclaim. Five cents. Five cents. Five cents. I mean, I don't know, something like that. If you're gonna do anything like that, why should I be the one paying the money? But I don't know. I don't know. But people have been getting better about reclaiming, so that's less of a problem now. Okay, last question. Is it congrats on the thousand subs and does having a thousand subs mean we'll be getting more content? So I have some plans. I know I've said it doing with zero K tutorial stuff. I've done some of that. There are some ideas that have come up in other videos as well about what to do for that. I'm planning at this point to At some point, people asked when I was doing the Dark Souls Let's Play to do a Hollow Knight Let's Play. I have the game. I'll, I'm thinking I'll do that at some point. Probably fairly soon. But at, at this point, I don't have any other plans. Really, just that. Mostly, if I do anything new, it'll probably on, be on the Twitch channel rather than the YouTube channel. I... I kind of want to keep the YouTube channel for the casts right now and maybe other things like Let's Plays and such that I'm testing to work. But a lot of stuff I'll be testing. There's some other ideas I have. That's going to be on Twitch. So just follow that and keep an eye on when things are going up there. Because I have some ideas for what to do beyond just 0k. We'll see what happens with that. But I like the idea of Twitch as an experimental platform more than YouTube. So expect stuff outside of the Saturday 0k expression match casts. Expect I might be playing other games and doing other things entirely. So yeah, stay up for the, stay tuned for that. But anyway, that is going to be it for these answers. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope that was informative and answered your questions. And again, if you have any more questions, well, I I mean, I usually answer them on stream anyway if people just ask questions while I'm streaming. But as far as an actual organized question thing, I probably will do this at some point. I mean, this is one of those things that apparently just gets done every few milestones of subscribers. So that's probably what will happen. But like I said, things, I answer questions on stream as well. So anyway, until next time, thanks for watching and have a good night, everyone.